deep left. That might send the Yankees to the World Series. For the hero in game seven. Clemens has set a major league record for strikeouts in a game. Derek Jeter with one of the most unbelievable plays you will ever see by a short stop. Red Sox fans have longed to hear it. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. Welcome to Fan Base, a deep dive into the greatest rivalry in sports. John Senecal, Brian Shackman with a special guest today. Uh, and it's special on multiple levels. Rico Bronia, Connecticut native. We are based in Connecticut for this podcast. Played Major League Baseball. Grew up a huge Red Sox fan. Got to play for the Red Sox. Got to hit a, an important hit for the Red Sox in a season uh, that they were hoping to unseat the Yankees. And so there's, there are so many things to talk about. So first, first of all, welcome. welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. It is a great rivalry. It, and, uh, it, fun to be a part of. So, you know, I'll just quickly get out of the way. In the mid-90s, I, I dated Rico's sister, who is a lovely human being. And I will tell you that it was right after Rico got called up by the Mets. It was your your first yeah. full season with the Mets. Yeah. And so what we would do is at any time we could peel away, I worked at the Taft Summer School, we would go down. And the family was so excited. I mean, this was such mm -hmm. a big deal. And that we'd go like, I must have gone about a dozen games that summer and we would like 24,000 fans in that stadium like it was not a lot of fans but they would go right. crazy and, and Greta and I would go up to the upper deck we're all the, like the Latino community would be up there with their whole families because they couldn't afford the really good seats watch the planes take off and almost hit you in the head right but they were up there <laughs> below, yeah. down below it's everyone's serious about being a fan up there they're singing and dancing and going crazy mm -hmm. and like when something went well at Shea even with 14,000 fans, you could hear it. It was rocking. Yeah. And um, just before we get to some of the other stuff, just talk about growing up in New England and having your family a car ride away when you're what? Like, I don't know, you were 25 years old. I think having my parents there um, when I went to the Mets was really cool. The best way to describe it is I think that, the, I don't know how loud I was, but the day I got traded from the Tigers to the Mets... I was in AAA, almost the big leagues, or at least hoping to be in the big leagues. Um, my options ran out with the Tigers to go. To the, they had to make a decision on me. You, 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 you were behind Cecil Fielder. Fielder. Yes, behind Cecil Fielder. My, my options to be uh, kept on a roster, protected, without being exposed to other teams was running out. Yeah. So if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna go into that, you might as well trade a player, get something in return. So I wasn't gonna bring back much in return, but. When they told me I got traded, I was in the Tigers' spring training offices. It was like the day before the spring training. That, that became a blessing for you, though. Yeah. Oh, man, I shouted. I mean, I was like, oh, you know, I can call my wife, and I can't believe I got traded. You know, the Mets, the Mets traded. For I mean, I, I walked out. I realized, like, every person in every office was like, who's that? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the best way to – because I thought, you know, my family would – it was close to home. But you, for you, you an opportunity. it was an opening to play. Yeah, I mean – that was the you know that was the primary or priority and um, my wife and I Melissa we were talking all spring training thinking this may happen you know but it, you don't know and we were you just start thinking about teams that may be looking at you might be a fit for um, and the Mets were often on our tongue you know we were talking about them as a team that we knew they had just gotten David Segui he also played some outfield um, and they were playing young players. Um, Joe McElvain, we knew the GM had actually tried to trade for me. One, the only time I knew in my, my early career that a GM was trying to trade for me when I was in AAA, either the year before or two years before. I spent like three and a half years in, you know, a lot of time in AAA. When he was with the Padres as the GM. Hmm. And I was told to expect a call and they, during a season when I was playing T Toledo. The, the, uh, the, the Padres are going to, you know, trade. I think it was Gary Sheffield and they want four players in return and you're one of them. And I was like, you know, I was like, at the time I knew the, the, the road to the Tigers was not was going to be tough. Yeah. Veterans and stuff like that up there. You know, you were you were a late round first pick. Um, you know, John was talking about earlier how the, is it a hard decision to go to Clemson or not? I mean, you've asked this a, long, a lot in your career, but maybe not recently. When you look back at that decision, you know, mm -hmm. was that the right decision? You know. Shaq, it's a great question. I don't think so. I, I, I don't regret making the call. I mean, I, have a, I had a, you know, 
I didn't know if I'd ever get a day in the major leagues, never mind, you know, eight, nine, ten years, whatever. Um, so I can't say it with any regret that I, or there's no regret in my heart for that. But if I had to do it over again, I would have wanted to play college. I would have wanted to play football. Um, everyone, oh, baseball's safer. You're not going to get hurt, you know, this and that. But football's different. I mean, I love baseball, but I love football. I mean, I don't know, you know, that that's just, and I would have loved to try to play college football. At Clemson, it was a great So sport. were you going to be try to be a quarterback? quarterback you were yeah. just kick. You were going to do both. Quar uh, I wasn't going to kick. They actually had a, they had a great, they had an NFL kicker and then he turned into an NFL punter. So they didn't need that. They, uh, they had Rodney Williams, a quarterback, a senior going out. They ran a little kind of option offense, a little Taft-like of old school. Bring back the Loomis prep school, uh, the little Taft rivalry there. Um, you had you big decisions to make. Talk to me. Talk to us about like what it was like at that time, though. Because now, if you see, you know, an MLB prospect, right, mm -hmm. and you were drafted number twenty-six overall, first round, mm -hmm. that that guy's gonna be everywhere. They're gonna be talking about him. You know, most people mm -hmm. d didn't know who Rico Bronia was coming out of Watertown, Connecticut. Right. How did how how are the scouts finding you, and what is that like as a as an eighteen-year-old kid dealing with? Yeah, it's complete. It's a great point. It's completely different today. I mean, there were there were there were not many that kind of fell through the cracks back then, but there were a lot more than there are now. I mean, there, you know, with all the showcases and you know social media and everyone's out there, um, video and everything like that. It's it, you, that was a, kind of an unknown. I think football got me in the picture. Really, it was okay. I think teams and scouts they go through periods of what's in, what's hot. Okay, that was a period where multi-sport athlete football players. I went. The Tigers also Bo drafted Jackson, Ricardo Ingram. There was DJ Bo Jackson, Dozier. Dozier. I went into instructional league with Ricardo Ingram. It was a, like uh, all ACC safety with Georgia Tech. Yeah. Baseball second turned into a major league baseball. But um, so I, I kind of fit that mold. And I think that at the end of the first round, the Tigers didn't have to spend a lot of money on me. You know, hundred thousand dollars in some school. And nowadays they go be for crazy it. money nowadays. Well, it'd be like Three, four million at the end. Oh of the yeah, that's and there's you know that's probably the biggest difference is the millions versus the hundred thousand. Now, are you at games in high school and, and playing and there's scouts there though? I mean, obviously yeah. they got to come watch. Yeah, they came. They started to the college recruiting started after my sophomore year for baseball and and um, football mostly, um, and that 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 uh, really my senior year for baseball the scouts came. They didn't really maybe over the summer. They might have showed up at some American Legion Don't games. Don't they come to like hoop games and football games too, though, to sort of see you in different environments? Or is that not? Is that kind of a myth? They did. No, they did. Uh, they the the some of the scouts that saw me over the summer, the the regional or local scouts. You know, they're um they're not like the whole East Coast. They're more Northeast. Uh, they if they saw me play over the summer, they someone told me they came to watch me play football. Um, I don't know about basketball. I know the college coaches did that like crazy. So because they, they're recruiting too, they want you to see them there. Right, right. And um, so they, they, they were basket they, in my basketball practices. My, my junior and senior year, there were coaches in the stands that were falling asleep after about half the practice. You know, he wants to talk <laughs> about. He wants to get into youth sports, but I have one more yeah. quick question on this because the money in the first round thing is is interesting because it's more tempting. If you get drafted 26 now, you're a millionaire instantly, right? right? But then also the organization has that much more invested in you, so they, they're right. probably more invested in you making the majors than they were back then. I don't know. Is that true? Absolutely. So is it, yeah. was it harder to make the bigs back then, or is it the same amount of difficulty? For, say, a first-round pick at 26. Yeah, there's definitely more. The financial, every every dollar added on is financial pressure for ownership. Hey, you know, they, when they make a decision on a GM to keep them or hot fire them or whatever, uh, they look back at their top draft picks, no no question. The GM will leave the draft room a lot of times after the second or third round and leave it to the rest of the scouts. He's the one, he's the one yeah. tacked on. Yeah, because it's on him who they pick first, second, or third. And right. So absolutely with the money nowadays. Back then there was some pressure because... It was more, how many of your first-round picks make it? Do you get those guys right? So even though the finance was, there was a similar pressure. pressure for the GMs or scouting directors, but no question, it's the, you know, the dial's been turned up with the amount of money now. But they did stick with me. I think the, the multi-sport athlete, football, basketball, baseball player in high school, came into play. They knew it wasn't going to be just add water, press a button, he's a big leaguer. It was kind of, I needed to fail a lot, and I failed a lot. I mean, it was, you know, repeat a year, repeat a year, three instructional leagues, three and a half years, triple A or whatever I think it was. It's still, still quicker, quicker than, than average, you said. Yeah, you made it like, like, like four years it took you about. My first call-up was fast, yes. Yeah. That's true. I actually, um, 
You're right. So I was 22. So I was 18. So within my fourth year, I was called up, but I was not ready. I was, <laughs> I was not ready. I thought it was, but oof, I was way Big off. Difference. Yeah, it wasn't like I could, I could run. I think I could hit. You know, I could survive if they allowed me to survive on a young team. But that was a veteran team with Sparky Anderson, and all the guys were in this and toward the ends of their. You know, they didn't necessarily want this young kid coming Did up. They there. even talk to you? Like not many. I mean, a couple of guys like Alan Trammell was awesome. He, you know, he's like, don't tie your shoes that way. You can't have, <laughs> we, they had the black spot, you know, with the orange on the road. But, you know, you can't wear orange laces with that. I had orange. You take those out. You know, but he was the only guy to do that in the clubhouse with me. Everyone else either joked, made fun of me, bullied me. But the old school way was, if you weren't being talked to, you should worry. Yeah. You know, if they're making fun of you, playing around with you, or... But the guys at my position, like Cecil, didn't really want it. He called me by the wrong name on purpose every day. Very nice but, guy. Yeah, and he was, you know, I'm sure behind the scenes he'd kind of wink at you or whatever, but because he was really cool. But um, they didn't want you to take their job. Yeah. I was a threat to maybe somebody, especially when I went deep in the first, second game and could pick it a little bit at first, run a little bit. A little bit quicker, quicker than the guy there. there. There's a lot of parallels, honestly, with my business. You know, like uh, when there's a bunch of anchors and you get new reporters and anchors, they look at you as a threat. And and there, there are the pros who can handle it and handle it with grace, and there's others that just and, – and listen, you don't – ultimately, you don't – blame them for wanting to protect right. what they got because it's really special to be able to play in the bigs but the the good ones know how to handle it in yeah. a graceful way they handle, it, they handle more uh, difficult situations that's why they probably sustain their value at a high level and keep it you want to talk about some useful well i, I want to talk about something else because he was talking about playing for the tigers and coming up mm -hmm. in the tigers organization now i'm not from connecticut i'm originally from albany new york and my first taste of rico bronia was playing for the New London, Ontario against Tigers, Albany, yeah. right, against Albany Colony Yankees, yeah. 1990, yeah. and I'm, a, I'm such a baseball nerd, yeah, he right? Yeah, some prospects on that team. I, I am a baseball nerd. The so, Yankees did. Yeah, the, Yankees the Yankees did. Had, yeah, had, we, had, we didn't. We had a couple, but had they, a, they, were, they were loaded. So listen, I'm a such a baseball nerd that I actually have a box score wow. from a game where you... You didn't bat against Kamenicki because he played the first game, but yeah. in the second game, you look down the bottom here, you went two for four with two home runs. Oh, it was a Militello? I can't remember. Sam Militello? Probably, maybe. Let's see. My eyes are just as I got bad, my, too. Um, my oh, no, you know what it was? It was Royal R.C. Clayton. Roy, Royce Clayton. Royal Clayton. Royal Clayton, his brother. Royal. Royal. Yeah, brother? brother. Yeah, they were, yeah. yeah, absolutely. He, he was, was Royal yeah, and his Royal voice was Royce. Royce. Did yep. Royal ever make it? He got uh, a cup of coffee, I think. Yeah, he might have got a call, but it's AAA, I know that. Um, By the way, tires are only 30 bucks. <laughs> That's a good deal. <laughs> they had all those lawsuits back in the early 2000s. Oh, look at this box. Score. I love it. Was JT Snow and Bernie Williams? Bernie Williams and, uh, was playing center field. Yep. Um, I don't know yeah. JT Snow. Greg Sparks and Don Sparks, not brothers. Right. Billy Massey, who actually Billy Massey, did the yeah. Connecticut Matty Capitals guy. for yeah. a while. Yeah. Um, and That's it's cool. crazy. I even, have, now, yeah. I even have, I even have tickets. Awesome. Wow. From the game. From the Albany Colony. That was the coldest place in April. Awful. I mean, the clubhouse wasn't a club. It was a locker room beyond left field. No you had to walk out there. You had to walk out there. So yep. it wasn't like you could go in between innings into the, into the locker room. and kind No. Nope. It was so it's... The, the visiting team had to walk the walk of shame out. Yeah. Now, the home team wasn't much better because they had to walk through the fans... Yeah. Underneath the bleachers and into like basically behind the concession stand. Yeah, the big bleacher side. The first and when I was a kid, I used to go and I would watch. Like, like you know, you're a prospect, so yeah. I would. I'm surprised. I I feel like I have a ball signed by you somewhere. Mm -hmm. I feel like it, but I can't dig it out of Those this. All this, in this, played them a lot. This was short. This was short notice here. That's but awesome. so that I used to really, go. That's really cool. I used to go and you know like um, the big prospects that came through playing against the Yankees because my dad night season tickets. I would go out there and I would wait why they walked out and if a guy broke a bat or something i would ask him for the bat and i was like a 13 year old kid and 99.9 .9 of the time they would give me the bat oh, i'm sure yeah and it'd be broken i take it back home my grandfather would put them back together to make them look real nice and i'd get them they come back in the town and i'd get them to sign the bat and so many of the players would be like look <laughs> at the bat and they'd be like this nice i'd be bat. like you gave me it and they're like that's the same bat <laughs> <laughs> is that where you met bobby dickerson and that's too? where i met bobby yeah so he has a life long friendship with Bobby Dickerson because oh, really? he met him when he was a teenager yeah he played and, the Albany Yankees and and they've is fascinating because they they became friendly and yeah, he just was he was being nice to a dad and his kid during a rain delay yeah and then Bobby went to your wedding yeah I was oh, in his wow. wedding yeah with that, Gerald that got you, uh, to they have that kind of relationship yeah so that I've been friends cool. with him for ages it's, it's 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 interesting how the connections you make over the years but it was so funny like 
Um, I, I mean, coming to Connecticut, I knew you, I knew knew of you, mm -hmm. but then you know Chris mentioned you, and then my, I think my wife was at the same game, and you know it, it just kind of clicked, and I was like, I remember watching you play for the New London Ontario Tigers. The uh, the you know it just it, it makes me think now they're that they're talking really um, pretty firm I think about contracting the minor leagues. Yeah, it's oh, pretty yeah. sad. So and I think you know a team like I mean would not, not be there, there, but would not be there. No, it you wouldn't. Know, and be then there. your experience would be gone with the players walking to the clubhouse, the bats meeting. And that's Bobby, what you're, and you still get you know, that at the lower, lower levels of the yeah. minor leagues. Now, granted, you go to the yard goats, and it's more of a major league experience. Right. But there's a lot of clubs around the United States where you're still going to get that kind right. of oh, really town feel. Yeah, I think I think you know I, I've given this a lot of thought because ultimately it stinks because the experience and athletes are different now. Like you know, if Bernie Williams is is playing low A or whatever, like people really know who he is, and he's probably hard to access even if he was coming through now. Right. So I think a part of that era sort of has passed by a little bit. Because yeah, even true. the guys in the Cape, they're kind of hard to access now, the college kids are on the Cape. But I would say is that I understand why Major League Baseball is doing it, because they don't, with the technology and scouting, they don't need a couple hundred people in their system yeah. to know who's going to make it. Yeah. But for the country, it stinks. It's it a small stink. town America. But just because it's like so great, and it gives people a chance to play and and sure, I, it's, it's affordable. Baseball can totally get away with a small minor league system because they don't need it, right? They don't they yeah. don't need it. But I, I just don't win. Don't win either way. I think. I mean, or the, maybe they want, you know financially. They, they want more you know control over things. You can centralize it a little bit. You don't you don't give up like part ownership to the team or GM to other people that right. are not with your organization. Every two years of changing they affiliates. They want to control it. Yeah, so you lose control. But I mean, that was in my opinion the awesomeness of the brand all the different branches that made america love baseball and or i think we still do but uh. i just saw on joe mauer when he was 18 i think you probably shot that yeah. story and the kid was just like mauer's just like you he was a three sports superstar he and man. he was mr minnesota right in right. basketball and like he's sitting there in new britain connecticut right. you know wondering what, what am i doing, <laughs> here? What doing here? here but like i could you could talk to him any day you wanted to yeah. you know and he ended up you know obviously health was a, an issue for him but he was, was a, a Hall pretty of darn good, caliber yeah. athlete Absolutely, right yeah. and that with new britain the way minnesota was you had all those so stories huge pipeline all, coming through ortiz yeah they uh, they kept their, they kept their players yeah you know, real quick, right. you know, we're talking with Rico Bronia here, John Seneca and Brian Shackman uh, with fan base, the deep dive into the greatest rivalry in sports. Wanted to quickly touch on some U sports things and then get to the Red Sox stuff because um, the story with the Red Sox and you is, is, is fascinating. You growing up a fan and getting not maybe the, all the moments you wanted, but one moment that will last a lifetime. But, mm -hmm. you know, you have a son. Who's who's an athlete? Yeah, and sure. you sort of brought it up, like you know, in terms of you have a son who plays competitive baseball. Yep. Two, and, two boys, and you got a lot of ideas on. on and I, I've coached a lot of little league baseball, and I'm I'm curious to see what your opinion is as far as you know the, the interest in baseball with youth. Um, it, mm -hmm. I I tend to think it's they're losing interest because it's it, it's a it's a thinking game it's a long duration game right and the kids nowadays are very mm -hmm. all over the place and they're going to tend to move, move towards soccer more where they're constantly moving it's an or basketball or even a tennis or something like that where baseball is more of just like you, you got to be 120 percent in mm -hmm. what's your what, what's your take you uh, I, I to, everything you said i totally think is uh you know i've said it many times now watching hunter play baseball he used to play lacrosse but since he's played baseball you can see the kids that really want to think in between pitches you know it's still the same though you want a pitcher to work fast and you want the pace to move but you really just want it steady so whatever it is you just kind of want a steady pace so you can get get a feel for the pace of the game but that's the beauty is the pace is never the same right so then another pitcher comes in it changes or 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 you know when you have a clock like in most sports the pace is kind of dictated by the clock. You right. know huddle offense. You got a four-minute offense. You got a shotguns, regular, whatever. Play clock five, four, three. Baseball is the game, and that's kind of what my dad always told me. It's so cool. You know, there's really no end. There's no zeros at the end on the on the scoreboard at the end of the game for the time. Right. You just play until the, the team, you know, with the last at bat. Take five hits out of money, ball. No, no clock on this. There's no yeah. clock. Yeah, but it's like that clock. The uniqueness of that clock that it changes many times within a game, within one game. Oh yeah. And then the next day it's completely different. And the next day, so 160, you know, every year it's got this different pace to it. But a, a, an MLB player or players, the pace will be consistent. So whatever it is, the players learn to adjust pretty quickly because it's going to stay the same. Right. The consistency level is so high. Minor league, not a little better or not as not as good, but you know, as you work down to college and high school. 
it just gets slower, and worse and slower yeah. or not as structured. Right. So it's fast for these two hitters, slow for that. There's no f feel for a pace. So for instance, like so. my, my son, who knows if he'll even play high school baseball, mm -hmm. but he had, I, with COVID, I had to get him doing something. And the only something we could get him into was, was AAU baseball. So I got, and they need the money, so they took my kid. My kid was probably bottom four or five kids in the team, although I think he could have played a little bit more than they played him. But, but what I want to say <laughs> was is that he, he started, and he's doing fall ball because he transitioned nice. from 12 to 13, so he's got to get used to the longer throws. Yeah. And so it's just fall ball. He's 13. Or he's 12, he's and he's going to be 13 in November. He's nice. undersized. But he's playing flag football just because his, his little brother was, he wanted to do it. And, and I, I took him, he went to flag football last night, he was late to hitting, and I told him, my, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I tell my kids not to lie. You know what I mean? But this time I said, blame it on me. <laughs> Tell him I was late getting out of work because they will bench him. They'll take it out on him. If he he was not there, because yeah. they want you 100% committed. Yeah. So if he was late because he was... Actually, he's 12. If he, yes. If he was late because he was late, benched. If he was right. late because he was a flag football, benched. So the only chance to him not get penalized is if it was my fault. If it dad's out from right. work. And, and so fun. I don't advocate mm. being a little... Mm. But then in that case, I wanted to protect him. So my point is, is that right. you are a three-sport athlete. This 12-year-old who's, who's a fringe kid is getting that kind of pressure. Like, do you think you would have quit, quit something? Man, yeah, that, that was... Um, I, I, it's different now than it was then. Is it, though? Was, was there pressure it was on just, you? It was just little league I back played then, though, right? how many different teams I played on in the summer. I played Pearl Street basketball, football camps, a baseball camp, Twymat baseball, American Legion baseball, got ready for football, you know, coming up with the lifting and you know throwing and stuff for the football season that was a day i mean you know it was like okay i got basketball three times this week baseball five you know it's like you just juggled but i think i tried to prioritize obviously if my dad was coaching the legion team which he did you know we had a really good team and, and it was like okay this is what we're doing no vacations you know right we're gonna play 50 55 games more than everyone else and, but you got to be in so I was in with that, but I, I definitely got to Pearl Street games at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock on those nights when we finished by 7, it gets dark. And, um, and you loved it? Loved it. I mean, you got to, couldn't get, then I'd go outside at home and hit and throw balls against the wall or a friend down the street and we'd play, you know, home run derby, wiffle ball in the backyard. There was no, it did, never got old. I think structure is, um, you know, it's, great when you get a little older i think kids if you're in it for the kids this is the way i think about it. if you're in it for them when they're 10 11 12 13 you know they don't know yet right they're just having fun they don't play as much backyard baseball or right. whatever right I can't stand it. yeah so now the the only time they get to do that is when it's in a structured environment right but it still should be less structured i, I would have so much not a problem with kids that means that tells me like a coach is interested in their record or how they're doing, and right. he wants to teach commitment. There's nothing wrong with that. At that age, that's a parental th a parental thing, maybe in the, in the kind of the bigger picture, broader picture here. But uh, let the kids do what. Hey, you know, um, you're a little late because you were doing flag football. I hope you had a great time. Yeah. You know, just yeah. jump in, but maybe wait till everyone's done right. and you're last. But right. you're still gonna get the hit. Right. I mean, it just that's yeah, it's a little extreme. Yeah, I just, true. you know, and these are all tropes and conversations that yeah. are had all over the place. I mean, the specialization uh, is a problem, but it's everywhere. And the kids want to, the parents want to return on their investment and the kids are, mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, I think that I want my kids to play whatever's in season is a priority. And, but I, it bugs me. Your guys, his two sons are really good about just going in the backyard and playing. They are. My guys, mm -hmm. the only thing they'll do now, they're into the Celtics, they'll go in my little crappy courtyard and shoot some shoot baskets. Some but like, I was like, why don't you guys go out and play wiffle ball? Yeah. Like, no. Like, it's just, I was like. Just go make stuff up. It's just crazy how little, how that's changed in, the, in childhood. So when you were, when you were younger playing, like in Little League and stuff, mm -hmm. you're left-handed. Mm -hmm. Now, you're probably one of the best players on the team, obviously. Now, were you, were you the one that had to get stuck catching as a lefty or playing shortstop as a lefty? Yep, I caught I caught all the way up into Legion. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, the catcher quit. I, got it, I remember. <laughs> I wasn't. I was going to play another position first. But the catcher quit. My dad went, you're catching. But at some point, you're sitting there thinking, like, all right, I don't think I'm going to make it as yeah. a left-handed catcher in the major league. They didn't even think about that. No. No, we had a game tonight to win. 
I was just trying to beat the next team we're playing. And, and you're older at this point. You're 17, yeah, that's, that's, 17 uh, 18 years yeah, old. Yeah, that's, that's, you that's know, yeah, great. that's almost the middle of high school. Right. That's a great point. So when did you decide you said, I'm going to be a first baseman? I didn't, I really didn't even, you know, it was really more, am I going to pitch or play a position? I just played first a lot because of the left-handed thing. And I didn't play a lot of outfield. And I think, you know, some, hey, he's okay over there, so we'll keep him there. But at the time, it was maybe pitch or play a position and hit. That was the only what you know thing that was out there but i didn't even think about that stuff like see i always feel bad like when i'm coaching a little league team and one of the best players is a lefty and like like oh we have like a lefty catcher's love yeah yeah i know and in it's the like, Oklahoma, and we like, have them too like, but it hurts oh. their future is that your right yeah. and the kid's 12 and i feel bad and then why isn't left why don't lefties catch I so i'm know. into the thing where okay i'm like traditional but why is Why that? Not? I mean, we're questioning everything nowadays. So the, you think Why are we not questioning I, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I always thought it was the, the concern over they hitting the, all the right-handed hitters in the head or when something. When they throw? I Why, you know, there's a lot of left-handed hitters that yeah. are right-handed catchers. If there's one technique to do it that way, why isn't it the same and technique? But it's about body churn, right? Isn't it about... A body turn? I would say that if you're a good enough athlete, you could probably play any position. I would love to see a major amazing, league, right? I mean, that's still, you don't see left. There's not a left-handed none. shortstop. None. No, there would be. Uh, Don Manning played some third, and that would be yep. the spot to play. There's a lot of uh, maybe second, but there's a lot of plays in the middle of the infield where it would take you a little more time. And you don't have that time. And you don't have that time up there, right? Third base, you can kind of play an angle. It's more like quick. Uh, the ball's on top of you. You can charge bump play a little differently to get there. But in the grand scheme of things, I mean, double play maybe, but when you're at the point where you you got a good idea that you got talent, you're going somewhere. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be a left-handed catcher in the major leagues. So you're either going to be a first baseman, mm -hmm. a pitcher. Now you got to choose either or. Yeah, they chose that for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was not a good enough pitcher. That arm, my arm was, uh, you know, I, I, high school was fine, maybe yeah. college or something. You know, it's interesting, before we get into the, the Red Sox Yankee stuff, I do want to, I listened to the Jay Payton thing you did with the Mets with uh, yeah. Howie Roseman. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and I think about sabermetrics and you're into the, the statistics stuff now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the sabermetrics and the statistical analysis would have affected how they would have approached your hitting or attacking you. But you were, he was a very good defensive First baseman, probably top three fielding percentage for first baseman. And almost first glove, uh, almost uh, gold glover. Yeah, you, there's one year you should have, you should, I mean, there's a couple years. Like three errors or yeah. something. Yeah. You should have had it. was like Gracie nine, nine, whatever. It was like unbelievable. But you talked about that in that um, conversation that I didn't think about it because everyone thinks from first base, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But when you can play a solid first base or have good range, it gives every position over Help. The, uh, the ability to be more aggressive. Right? No question. And so I, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. And I wonder if this, the database stuff of now would probably have given you more credibility as a first baseman. Because I think that they can calculate how many outs and runs you save. Yeah, defensive run. The metrics are improving for defense. It's still going to be probably the last to be as accurate or the least accurate of all the. There's a lot of factors with defense that come into play that it's hard to really uh, calculate perfectly. <laughs> You know, as you can do with maybe some hitting and pitching stuff, or be closer to closer to home with those. Um, no question, it's a teammate. This is why I think it's kind of difficult to measure. It's more of a team-oriented position. You can do things for other players that don't necessarily get measured or valued as much, except by your teammates. Like they, a scoop or something know. like that. Or yeah, or really the main thing is that they have guys head on first base. Yeah, they have the con they have the confidence to make every throw. So they can make plays, which is what you're talking about, right? They so they're gonna try to make plays, and they're gonna be not gonna hold back. Not gonna hold back. So all their ability can come out, right? And that that doesn't always happen. They there's always a, they can serve something, huh. you know. If if they're not confident in the first baseman, more than just something, a lot more. But if they can let it all go, okay. So let's let them be their best them. And then also you can if you have range, like J T. Snow was unbelievable. His range, and he won it the year I a year I didn't, but he should have won it maybe a couple years with the Giants because he was a cat. So he was this unbelievable Don Mattingly like her Keith Hernandez like first baseman. Everyone on the infield can just shift over. Yeah. So the, when I've scouted a lot of play, you know, in the pros and the minor leagues and MLB, the, the biggest mistake I see at first base and I see, definitely see it in the, in the amateur levels is they just don't know how to, where to, where to line up. Their positioning is so off and they, they just don't A, get coached on it probably and B, they just want to get to first base so if a throw's coming to them, they can just put their foot on the bag, turn around and catch a throw. So what we learned to do was run all the way from the outfield grass almost, 
while this guy with a great arm is about ready to throw it, you're halfway there. you got to be there. Yeah, and you're going to be there, and you're going to make a play if it's a bad throw. Right. So that so the player has way the faith lost. That, so the player will make the throw essentially before you're in there. Yeah, it's like a quarterback, quarterback throwing an out route. Yeah, right. he's, he's doing it before the break. Um, but it's not before the break because it's what you do. Right. Nowadays, you watch the clunk clunk, you know, he's 12 by 12 off the base. You know, he's cookie cutter. Play here. Right. And then a ground ball goes through the four hole. And he takes two steps, but maybe I should get first. I, my first day with a new team, ever, or even my same team every year with the new pitchers, uh, uh, during PFP, pitcher's fielding practice, PFP, would be, I'm going after everything cover first. That was my only instructions to the new pitchers. Like, if they didn't know me, or right. I didn't know them, I would just tell them, I'm going after everything, so cover. Hmm. So th and when there's doubt, they know you're going to be going for it. Yeah, so there, when there's no doubt, there's no mistakes. So I told him, I'm going after, I'm going to dive, I'm going to try to make Whatever plays, I gotta do. push the second baseman up the middle. So their default response is to go to first. Go to first. Right. Be there. If, you, if we don't, you know, I'm not going to try to get that ball and then recover. Right. So, I mean, this is great, you know, positions. I love it. That's the minutia of the... That concludes this episode and part one of our conversation with former major leaguer Rico Bronia. Tune in to the next episode when we talk to Rico about his huge home run as a member of the Boston Red Sox. You've been listening to Fanbase, a deep dive into the greatest rivalry in sports. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.